welcome back to Living History with Ted Goldsboro and our guest, General Julius Becton. We're greatly honored to have Dr. Beck or Mr. Becton with us, General Becton with us today, and we appreciate his coming uh, from Virginia. Uh, General Becton, we were talking about uh, your military career, and I had put aside this one picture that I wanted to, to talk a bit, little bit about. Uh, when would yes. this have been about? 1945. 45, so your first year in the military. No, I became military in 1944. 44. 44. I got commissioned in 45 okay. through Officer Candidate School. Okay, now you went to Keesler and then you went to uh, Florida. Yep, because I got wiped out of flight school, pre flight school because of vision. They went to McDillfield in Florida. Okay. Joined an aviation engineer unit. And the only thing aviation about that, we put down PSP, mm. Pierce Steel Platform, mm. for landing aircraft. Oh. And I was able to get out because I was able to convince my first sergeant and that. Uh, he thought I should take advantage of OCS since I was trying to become a, I was in pre-flight training. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And from that, good things happened. Good. Um, were there other blacks in your class in Officers Candidate School? Yes, there were 20. Um, we had 200 total students or candidates. And the thing which is not too well known in the officer candidate school, once you crossed the line where the school was located, there was no segregation, oh. zero. Oh. You were assigned based upon the alphabetic order uh -huh. or your height or whatever. Okay. Your sleeping quarters were oh. the same way. That's good. And it was completely integrated. Once you crossed the line, that it, the line say off the post at Fort Benning, Georgia, you were back under the mm, mm, segregation of mm, Jim Crow. Mm. But that was different. The officers' rules were different from the enlisted rules for black people. Yeah, but I'm talking about schools. Yeah, but uh, let's say that you had stayed an enlisted man and you're over in McDill or over in Keesler. No, no, you did, you're still you're under the southern way of doing business. Oh, okay. And, and the blacks slept together, ate together, That's went right. to class together? Yep. Okay. But once you become an officer or you're in candidate school for officers, then you can mix with the we whites. We were, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. I wouldn't put it quite like that, but mm -hmm. we were treated like mm -hmm. everyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't recall. Of course, we could talk so much. Let's talk a little bit more about your military career. You became a second lieutenant, and then where? And what happened? Second lieutenant, 1945. I went off. To, I got commissioned on the 15th of August, 1945. What else happened that day? They dropped the second bomb. Oh, on Hiroshima. On Hiroshima. Oh. And wow. The war was over for all practical purposes. Yeah. But I was sent to a unit in the Pacific, uh, and I arrived in the mid part of September, went to a place called Moratai, which is north of New Guinea, south of the Philippines, an all black division except for the white uh, senior officers. But other than that, there was strictly a, a black unit and 93rd division. And something which they did, which a lot of people are not aware of, for the entire war, they had two divisions side by side whenever they went the 93rd Division and the Dixie Division, 31st Division, Dixie Division. Why would they put those two together? I have never found out. I couldn't find out from reading the archives or anything else. Mm. Um, did they have conflicts? Yes. But uh, when you keep them fighting the, the bad guy, the enemy, mm -hmm. it wasn't too mm -hmm. much problem. But I have never found out why they would do that. Mm. Did you, were you flown over there or take a ship over to into the South Pacific? To, to 1945. <laughs> we didn't have many ship planes that could fly you that far. I was on a ship. Okay. I guess that was the longest ship trip you ever took. It was a long trip. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh -huh. It was an integrated ship? Yes. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, um, the even in, I can't remember where the living up compartments were integrated because we didn't have cabins as such. Oh. We had just like barracks and oh. one, two, three oh, deck, oh, 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 upper oh. deck, middle deck, bottom deck. And if you're um, on a bottom deck and oh. your guy above you have to throw up, guess oh. what happens? Oh. Oh. It makes for a very interesting were you, climate. You were Air, Air Corps, but you were on a Navy ship. I mean, no, but when I was down with Air Corps, infantry, officer candidate school, infantry. Oh. And so, so you were you were in the Army, not Army Air Corps. That's correct. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I forgot about that. Okay, okay. Um, when we're talking about the military, did we talk enough about General Arnold? Did we did we finish with him? I said why. Well, oh, one other thing I did mention to you earlier. Even to this day, I have great delight when I talk with some of my colleagues. Uh, the senior Air Force officers. I've been on a couple of studies in which we had a chance to interview the chief of staff of the Army, of the Air Force, and I would invariably say, General, I've done something you've never done. What are you talking about? I have shaken Hap Arnold's hand. <laughs> what was that situation? How did that happen? Well, he was at our school. He oh, was he was okay. talking to the students. Okay. And uh, some of the kids stayed behind to talk to him, and I was there, and he never <laughs> shook his hand just like everyone else. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny yeah. for me to tell that my colleagues yes. that. Yes. To my knowledge, he's the only five-star general. <laughs> he's the only general, I guess we could say, forget the five stars, who was, no, he was five-star general in both the Army and the Air Force. How did that happen? Well, we had during World War II, the grade of five stars. We haven't used that since World War II. And Hap Arnold was the chief of staff of the Army Air Corps. Five stars. Uh, we had Marshall, five stars. Eisenhower. Eisenhower, mm -hmm. five stars. MacArthur. MacArthur, five stars. There's only one left, I think. I think there were only five of them. There were. Yep. Yeah, uh, Bradley? Maybe. Maybe. I but should know better. Anyway, how did he the happen? El the elephant. How did Arnold happen to be five stars in two branches of the service? Well, he started off in the Army Air Corps. And when the Air Force got their status, he was no longer on active duty. Right. Because I think the Air Force came in 1948. That's right, that's right, or 47. And he was already, He's already off, but retired. I guess it was an honorary thing. Well, I don't know what the Air Force does in mm -hmm. those days. <laughs> well, I think they, they named him General of the Air Force, well, but it was just, <laughs> hey, <laughs> fine. <laughs> uh, he came back in 19, well, he came back in 1947, and we have pictures of him in a parade in Lower Marion. But he was supposed to come back for the dedication of the Chichester Field, which we named Arnold Field, in 1950. But he died a few weeks before he came back. So I guess he wasn't too well in mm -hmm. 1950. He lived out in California. Uh, we have uh, a picture here of your family. And I could wonder if you could tell me what that event was. Yes, I, I belong to an organization like most members of the Army. It's the Association of the United States Army. Association of the United States Army, AUSA. And it's prides himself with being the voice for the Army. We don't, can't be a lobby, but the voice for the Army. And they have been very effective in putting forth the Army story of who we are, why we're doing what we're doing. And each year they have an annual convention. Matter of fact, one's coming up in the 21st of uh, October. And if you're in the Washington area, you will see the largest assembly of Army people for the week mm -hmm. in parts. 
One of the things they do uh, pertain to this picture, they give an award each year called a Marshall Award. General George Marshall, Chief of Staff for the Army, etc. And it's a very prestigious award. To, uh, people who've gotten it, um, Colin Powell's a recipient, um, matter of fact, two weeks, uh, next month, Bob Gates will be the recipient for this year. Uh, it's at that level. Um, uh, Bush 41 is a recipient, uh, and it so happened I was voted to receive the award. Mm -hmm. And in, in 2007, I gathered my family and we went to Washington and I received the award, and that's, mm -hmm. that's my family member. There and you were, you were kind enough to invite me, and I took the picture. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Did you take this picture? Yes, sir. This I, one, but I'm sure there are more professional I, I ones thought, than this one. I didn't realize that, but I thought that was one they, they took. No. Well, okay. <laughs> now, some of these are your children, I we're guess, in the five, front row. Five adult children, mm -hmm. one son, the junior, and four daughters. Mm -hmm. And there are 11 grandchildren, and there are three great-grandchildren. Oh. Now, General Beckton, you won't believe it, but uh, our time is up, and I certainly appreciate your coming and being interviewed, and I wish we had more time, but thank you very much. Well, my pleasure, Ted. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, this is Ted Goldsborough signing off for a Living History with General Julius Beckton.